Uh, I have so many questions, and, but we do have to be selective. Uh, so I'd like to start. Uh, by th I thought a little bit about this, um, the AVOD transformation. I mean, there's also a, a technological shift that is happening as more and more of the audience are moving to smart TVs. Uh, so a lot of these services will be apps, and, the, and also just from how we interact with the interfaces, the, the, these libraries will increase in value perhaps also in that way. And people are talking about subscription fatigue, so AVOD is also solving a practical problem for a lot of people uh, in the audience who just can't handle having uh, more subscriptions. That said, there will be a ton of AVOD services, in the next three, five years, certainly we will have more SVOD, premium SVOD services than ever. Will not the audience become inevitably very fragmented? Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question because it's a, it is a problem. But it's, I think it's a problem because of the way that navigation and uh, user interfaces work within the streaming space, i.e. they're all different. Um, we're used to, in television, and happy to subscribe to 200 television channels. But as soon as you talk about streaming platforms, make you say, well, I'll, I'll take two, but I'm not going to take more than that. that. That, to me, doesn't quite add up. I think the problem is discovery and user interface. And if someone can solve that, and indeed that is actually Apple's strategy or what they're hoping to do. If someone can solve that, I think it will help break through that ceiling of what you're calling um, fatigue around subscription uptake. I think there is, there's certainly um, money there because even if you take four or five streaming platforms, you're still at half the average spend on US pay TV, for example, plus you add in the AVODs, which don't cost anything. So I think there's um, financial capacity and I think there's a ceiling to break through, which will be broken through by platforms like Disney, but it can be helped by the interface. Now that brings us on to all sorts of other questions like who controls the interface, who controls the data, how do we break down things like that? So there are lots of issues, um, but I don't think it's entirely insurmountable. I'm waiting with excitement for the moment when I can just commit to, like I have to pick Amazon channels or Apple TV channels or something like this, and then I just have that universal search and it's just going to be a television all over again, yeah. except I get to pick when to watch. That said, we know there's a lot of competition. There are a lot of, of these services out there. What is a hit? Will we still have television hits and then how do we define them? Um, what is a hit show? So that's a very good question. What is a hit show? It depends on who you are. Um, if you're Amazon or uh, Netflix, it, it, a hit show is something that leads to a lot of trial starts or a lot of sign-ups. Um, so we're, we're kind of removed partially from the concept of viewing being the, the, the hit maker and more onto business dynamics around sign-up, trial start, churn reduction, all of the measures that uh, a player like Netflix or Amazon um, measures its success by, and especially Amazon, who of course, and other platforms, Apple as well, whose main business is not content production and distribution, whose main business is selling iPhones or selling um, bin liners, in, in the case of Amazon. Of course, what they want is you to sign up to Amazon Prime. But it uh, creates a strange situation for the producers, because the, it, in a way, the, I mean, the customers aren't the viewers at all. The viewing becomes irrelevant on these platforms. Uh, and, and also, you don't have access to the data, so you wouldn't even know if anyone was actually... Yeah, I wouldn't go so far as to say <laughs> the viewer is irrelevant, because ultimately, it's the viewing that's driving the other thing that Amazon or Netflix or Apple are measuring as a measure of success. Mm -hmm. So it's still important. Um, it, it, it works in a different way. The whole dynamics that we're used to in the industry of windowing and a long life cycle for a piece of content, particularly for a movie that might start in a, in a cinema, that, that's been very compressed into a much shorter, um, short, sharp burst, an explosive, explosive burst, and then it disappears into the ether. Mm. Um, so, in terms of the way we think about viewing and the life cycle of content, that has absolutely changed completely. And, and to follow up a little bit on the content spend uh, that you were so fascinatingly presenting, I noticed that you had uh, put HBO Max and HBO as separate columns. 
surely very soon that will be the same number, so they will actually be a much bigger commissioner. Absolutely, yes. And we, you know, internally we talk about all sorts of ways that we can greet people. Um, you know, War Warner in particular like to think about their businesses separately, but if, if you greet Warner HBO Turner, obviously you get a much bigger entity either in commissioning or spend. So it's, it's really about how you count your coffee beans. We, uh, uh, all of this, this data that we were looking at was, of course, without the sports rights. But yes. we need to maybe say something about sports rights as well, because if sports rights are moving to the streaming services, which seems long-term to be inevitable also because they're becoming so expensive, um, this will drive drama watching, or certainly at least it will drive subscriptions. Uh, potentially, yes. I think that sports has other challenges. Um, one is they're losing the young audience um, mm. quite rapidly for many reasons. One, because it's not accessible because it's on pay TV. It's locked into pay TV, which huh. younger people are not watching so much. Um, but also other things are taking their attention away. Again, back to the attention deficit that we heard about in, in the first presentation. Um, sports are important. And if you like sports, you, you love sports and that's your sole driver. But actually, it's only about 40% of people who are in that group, and the other 60% prefer other things. So while sports remains important, I think it's declining slightly in terms of its overall importance to the market. That's really interesting. Uh, and yes, because of course, then we always forget to talk about esports, which is available, on, uh, when, which may be driving the viewer to much more digital channels, where it more naturally... Yeah, yep, absolutely. Esports is big, again, among a certain group. I mean, money-wise, it's still quite a small part of the overall entertainment uh, economy, mm -hmm. but it's certainly making a lot of noise among a specific subgroup of gamers and, and young people. And also, I, I realize this might be affecting the US market more because sports betting has become, uh, is becoming legal, so, so that's going to affect viewing patterns around... Um, around real-time sports in that way. I wanted to ask a little bit about, uh, you had this wonderful slide uh, about where production will be moving. Uh, and Germany, for instance, was m mentioned as an underweight production market. Could you just like tease out for us, what is an underweight production market? Um, so we did an analysis where we uh, correlated the current and forward original production of Netflix with the simply the market size, how many customers they have in the market. And there was a very strong relationship, as you might suspect. Um, and, and so what you could do from that was two things. One, by looking at the next biggest markets, say, well, that's obviously where they're going to go next. But also looking at some of the big markets that perhaps had less production than peer markets of similar size, those would be under, underweight. So we had Australia there, we had Germany there. Um, and some of the other European markets. And, and it, it, you know, there are lots of dynamics going on. The reason um, Latin America is overweight is because they speak Spanish, and Spanish travels quite well, so they're overweight. India was overweight because clearly Netflix sees massive potential in India, um, and it has a lot more original production than it should have for the market size should, at the yeah. moment. But other markets in Europe, Germany, France, were a little under. Also, there are stronger local competitors in the Indian market as well, so they have to go in with, uh, with the originals. Uh, it, I wonder if, if you're an under, in an underweight production market, what that means essentially is, is, there, is there is more potential, that if, if, the, if there is production capacity and quality ideas, there will be a commissioning. There will be. And as we've seen in France, there's also government intervention that they want to introduce a, um, a quota for investment finance, so production finance at 25% of local revenues. So all sorts of things going on in those markets. But yes, where they're, where, where they're underweight, there should be more potential for local production. So combined to what we were seeing in the beginning with what we think is happening with the content quotas, which I thought it was a brilliant insight that of course some of this might be resolved with rights, there will be um, a lot of production pressure, pressure in the markets that are currently underweight, but those commissions will want pan-European rights yes, in all likelihood. Yes, exactly. So, so two, two positives, actually, because if people are demanding greater geographic rights, the price goes up, of course, and, and then the pos other positive for potential for local production. So do you know how the Nordics are doing? Are we punching above our weight? 
Um, in some ways, yes, because you have strong local players as well, like Via Play, who are heavily involved in original production as well. Um, and also Nordic Noirs, we've been hearing a bit about uh, it, it travels quite well, or it's starting to travel quite well. So the Nordics are an interesting market. They've always been a bit of a bellwether because they're slightly more advanced in terms of their adoption of new technology, and that goes for streaming platforms as well. So they're, they're certainly on par or slightly above weight. Uh, you mentioned that, or you talked about co-production as a, as a necessary evil. And I, I think it's been a while since we thought about, since many of us thought about co-production as, as difficult or evil or, or a bad thing. Oh, I mean, and then it's like, oh, it was in the old times, like 60 years ago. You would still sometimes hear words like Euro pudding, which was supposedly the result of trying to make something together. But now I, I think our mind has shifted to like, oh, no, of course, co-production is the best. Everybody should co-produce more of that. Uh, how do you... Have you seen that, there, that it is, in fact, more complicated, or is, is this like a, um, an ideological, just like the tradition that we are we're still looking at it as a complex No, I think endeavor. it's ideological. I, I think there's, a, uh, as you say, a realization in the market that ha however many partners you, you have, you have to have a strong lead within a co-production, and, and that realization has, has taken root. Um, as you say, we're too many cooks spoil the broth. So. Um, the necessary evil really because of budgets and because of the financing demands that mean more and more partners are often required um, and the fact that that can be more complex than the old days when maybe you got uh, a, a, a large chunk of the budget from the local broadcaster and took the deficit out to international distribution um, and solved it that way. But yes, and I say for now because while it's being supported by local broadcasters at the moment, there's nothing to say that they won't start to go direct and expand their geographic footprint as well, and then look to take and hold on to more rights. So it's an opportunity at the moment, but it may well change as well as we get more and more disruption. And the, the unions, uh, the rights holders organizations of different kinds, of course, are, are very wary about about the tendency uh, of, of selling more rights in general. So there's also, for very good financial reasons for them, of course, they're also pushing back against these, these tendencies. Yes, I think, I think it's, a, it's a strange balancing act for distributors. It, you know, a one-stop shop, a one-stop deal with Netflix is attractive. But when you can sell individually, as long as you get some of the key markets, you'll get, you're probably going to make more money. So. It's weighing up the risk and reward always in, in any sort of rights uh, relationship and negotiation with a global player. I, I learned recently that uh, the MPAA in, in the US um, was looking at, at US cinema goers and they identified a segment, uh, or they have identified a segment called frequent cinema goers, which is about 12% of the population, but they pay for about 49% of the box office. These are people who go to the cinema a lot. And I was thinking about your TV lovers. Uh, do we know, is there a type of viewer who just loves TV drama, who's just going to watch everything? Or is, are the older types of segments, other types of segments still more relevant? Well, it's interesting that we've seen TV drama ascend to, to the key content driver, equal and on a par, and in some cases greater than movies. Because back in the day, um, it was uh, one of Rupert Murdoch's uh, senior execs who described sport and Hollywood movies as the twin battering rams for success. If you were to say that today, especially if you're streaming platforms, your battering rams would be TV drama, definitely. Um, so there's been a fundamental shift in um, how many people see TV drama as a driver for their decision to watch or purchase um, a TV platform. So I. I love it that you rely on the statistics and I like to speak very calmly about this, but if, if you, if you would, would be willing to just like speculate wildly and make like a grand statement, what is the big threat to European drama production right now in the next, let's say, five years? And, and what are, what, how would you summarize the opportunities? 
Well, I, you know, it's, uh, among all the opportunity, it's, it's harder to pick out a threat. I mean, the, the big threat is that budgets become so high, talent becomes so scarce, facilities become so scarce that people have to look at elsewhere. Um, you know, we're already seeing a situation in the US and some other markets where simple, simply access to sound stages is a problem. Starting They're to be fully the same booked here, for yeah, five everywhere. years. Mm -hmm. um, and facilities and, and all the technical staff and all the talent around that, let alone writers. And so the big, the big risk is that we, this cycle that is perpetuating all of the trends and all of that increase in budget and necessary spend knocks Europe out and so that we go elsewhere, maybe India, China, um, Middle East. So that, that's the risk. Um, you know, the opportunity is multiple, and I, I think I touched on many of those in the presentation. The opportunity is that is there's an absolute insatiable demand for quality drama. You know, two years ago it was referred to as a bubble, but it's not a bubble. Not for, yeah, not for a good five years at least. No. Would you say that the demand is so high that there is in fact also space for the European uh, rights holders to negotiate on a completely different way, much more aggressively about their rights than they have before? Um, I, I think there's opportunity to be forceful. Um, it's, it's, it's very difficult because it, it, everyone's individual circumstance is different and mm. the financing and what they need to raise or, or support is different. So it's very difficult to say one yeah, approach works, it, it, a multitude is required, but certainly, you know, rights value for pan-regional deals is a strong bargaining card at the moment. That is wonderful news. I have one minute of information of you, after which you will get a gift, so don't leave the room, but first we will give a big thanks to Guy Bisson. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.